to call the Graham County Board of Education regular meeting April 5th, 2022 to order. Uh, Mr. Moody, would you mind praying for us? Dear Grace, uh, thank you for all you've done for us, Lord, your grace, and uh, our spiritual freedom in you, Lord, and uh, Lord, I know it's really living, we live in a chaotic world, but Lord, we just have to keep in mind that, that, that you're still in charge and you're still on the throne, and uh, that you're here for us, Lord, and I just pray that you give us godly wisdom uh, to do your will, and just glorify you when it comes to dealing with kids, Lord, who we know are, are special in, in your sight and in your heart. And Lord, thank you for that opportunity to do what's uh, in the best interest of these kids and, and, and give them to us to protect and to help Lord and to serve for uh, Be the board today, be the leaders, our administration, teachers, Lord, anybody that, that works here, Lord, and just, uh, just help us always do your will. Do us Lord, by you, Lord, and look to you and uh, thanks seem to be them because Lord, we know that you can help us. Thank you for all you've done for us. You're the best. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda for today? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Do I have a motion to approve the prior minutes of March 1st, 2022. Approved. Do I have um, a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? The floor is now open for public comment period. Do I have a motion to close the public comment period? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, principal director updates. Mr. Madison, start us off. All right, so uh, a couple things about some of our seniors. Uh, first, 51% of our senior class has uh, done the necessary uh, applications and things to further their education upon graduation, about their FAFSA completed, their college applications are in. A lot of kids are hearing from uh, their colleges whether they've been accepted or not. And uh, just found out last week that two of our students, Cheyenne Rowan and Montana McKinnon, had received the Hagen Scholarship. That scholarship is worth $48,000. Plus it comes with a $15,000 investment account that they received upon graduating from college. And it pays for them to study abroad. So it's a great scholarship. And uh, I think that's the first time we've had two kids in the same graduating class receive that. So I'm really excited for them. Our guidance office has started the registration process on March 15th. We actually had a meeting with the eighth grade and parents. We had 63 parents show up that meeting where we talked about those kids coming into high school and what classes we offer, especially focused on CTE and some of the new career and technical education programs we're going to be offering. And uh, as of right now, we've got that group registered. We've also registered uh, the juniors, uh, the, actually the sophomores for this year, and the seniors, and then we worked on the juniors this week, so all of our kids will be registered for their classes for next year before spring break. And uh, in CTE, uh, the last week of March, I completed the uh, director's induction one uh, down in Greensboro. It was a series of five trips down there for me, and uh, really learned a lot during that. It was a really good experience, and uh, looking forward to some of the changes that we're gonna be making in CTE for next year. And I also have something that I would like to share with the board about senior project. So uh, over, I think we've been doing senior project about 25 years. And after meeting with my uh, English department earlier in, in this semester, uh, they have asked that we stop doing senior project. Well, a couple years ago, the board kind of turned it back over to the school as far as policy goes. But they have brought a proposal to me for what they would like to replace senior project with. I just want to share this with y'all. And I think, uh, I think it's a really, really good plan. And then uh, y'all can ask me any questions about this if you want to. But basically, what it would be is uh, their justification is that seniors and senior, senior English teachers devote a great deal of time to the project, leaving little time for other activities and assignments in English 4. 
Uh, as the department, they feel the following changes would allow for more time to focus on the needed uh, English language arts career and college readiness skills that are sometimes sacrificed due to senior project. So the proposal basically is that in English 3 and English 4, they will still do some uh, a project kind of like senior project, but they will have all the requirements that our current senior project has, and they'll spread it out over two years instead of one. And uh, for instance, in English 3, uh, the students will begin a digital portfolio uh, on a Google site, and they'll uh, the portfolio will be cumulative, showcasing work done to prepare for a career during the students' junior and senior years. As junior students would be begin planning short-term and long-term goals, both both personally and professionally, using a provided template and write a resume. They would also have to do five <coughs> job shadowing hours during their junior year. And then the senior year, they just continue to build on that. They would do five more job shadowing hours. So the, basically what it would do, it would become a project done within the two uh, English classes, English three and English four, and it is a career uh, workforce development type project. So uh, the English teachers have brought this to me. I think it's a great idea, a good plan. And uh, I just wanted to kind of share this with the, with the board that rather than normal senior project, this is the direction that we would like to go. When would you like to begin this? We'd like to start this next fall. So, would you start with the juniors? We would start with the juniors and the seniors next year. So the seniors next year, they would do a little bit more uh, things in senior English that first year, but they would be required to do the five job shadowing hours and all that, yes. But, and they'll do the resumes. So there'll be a few things added next year for that but uh, they feel like they can do it and it'll save them time, give them a better opportunity to cover their curriculum, and it's introducing kids uh, kind of to the workforce and the possible careers that they're interested in, and you know, it goes on, it really goes well with a lot of the goals that uh, you know, our state superintendents put before us and things. So. Have y'all talked to the kids about this? Uh, yeah, they are aware that there's a possibility that senior project is going to no longer be re required in the way that it was, and uh, they're pretty excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Mr. Madison, I want to commend you. I know this has always been your baby, but I want to commend you on letting your teachers kind of take the lead on this. And well, we we just sat down. I mean, I just put it out. I said, look, I said, you know, what can we do to make our school better and what can we do, what changes do we need to make in this area? And we work together and this is what we all came up with and I think good. I think it's really a good idea for our school and I think it'll help our be very beneficial to our kids. Well, as a board member, I want to say thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that, Ms. Nall. Yeah, do we have to approve this? No, no, no. Okay. Just put your hand up. Thank you. 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 And they're going to do public speaking in the classroom, and uh, we're considering even offering a public speaking class for our kids. So, uh, you know, there won't be the speech part to it, and uh, there'll still be a paper during their senior year that every kid has to write. But it'll be all the papers will be career based. So, uh, I think it's I think it's a really good thing, and you know, it may lead a kid into a profession that they go into for their lifetime, and it may also show some kid, hey, maybe this is not what I want to do. And give them, you know, the opportunity to change before they go into college. So, Mr. Mastin, I'm going to give you a heads up. You may have a student coming to you about possibly wanting to start and do mock trials. So, I want to give you a heads up on that. Yeah, that yeah. I don't yeah. know what the deal is. But yeah. That'll be good. I mean, that's that's it good. It would be great at leading that. I think. That's so. a little bit like. Um, also, let me just share too. I met with uh, Southwest. What's the Southwestern Commission and uh, uh, Create Bridges? been meeting with them, the CTE directors from around uh, the county, and they have got a pot of money that they're going to kind of put in the schools. And one of the things that uh, we discussed is the possibility of putting kids in internships. That's something that Graham County Schools has not done in the past. We've never really had internships in our career and technical education department, but we would put kids in internships and then they would receive a stipend from this pot of money for completing that internship. So uh, the kid can get, you know, uh, a course credit for doing an internship plus on the job training. So uh, I think there's several businesses in our county, especially uh, the money has to be related to the hospitality and tourism field. 
So I think definitely, you know, maybe there will be some partners with some of our restaurants and, uh, you know, Topoca Lodge, maybe Fontana Village, and uh, the kids would go and work for an hour and a half or up to three hours during the school day, get credit, and then possibly get a stipend at the end. So we're excited and hope that they, uh, hope they approve the uh, plan that we put before them. So and we got spring sports going on, and uh, I guess our next uh, home softball baseball will be on Thursday against Cherokee. So everybody's doing great. Thank you. Do you know we have on baccalaureate or graduation? Uh, yes, uh, the baccalaureate is at seven o'clock on June the first, which is Wednesday. Graduation is at eight o'clock on June the third, Friday night. Where's the baccalaureate? Did you it's going to be at the football stadium. Yep. Both events at the football stadium. June 3rd at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock will be graduation. Okay. Have the name of the speaker yet? They have not. No. Mr. Nails. Well, good morning. Um, as y'all know, the eighth graders are off on their trip. Um, I talked to Miss Walsh this morning and checked in with them. They're having a good time. Uh, today's uh, outline is they're going to go see Hatter's Lighthouse, uh, Cape Lookout, I think what it was. Um, to the British graveyard, go to the graveyard of the Atlantic, and uh, ride a ferry. So that's kind of on the agenda for today. Uh, with the coast trip, uh, ag class within the CT stuff in middle school, they had some, uh, Miss Ware brought some of her goats down so the kids could get out and do some handling and some livestock and get involved in that. And they brought some bees down from Wareland, and uh, the beekeepers let the kids put on the beekeeping suits and. Uh, actually see it. They didn't handle the bees, but they got to see them inside the, the caves. The, the kids really like that. Uh, also in art, uh, they've done the barn quilt paintings, and they're on display now in the commons area. If you get time to go check those out. Uh, with Gear Up, they're helping uh, with funding for raised beds for the ag classes as well, so they can get some, some stuff in the ground in the spring and start growing stuff. And they're also helping provide a weather station for the seventh grade weather class to monitor and update what current weather. They're wanting it to be um, in sync with weather underground so a school can now be a, a check-in point for like the National Weather Service and stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, this, the whole middle school had a professional <laughs> development uh, last work day with uh, through Gear Up in Appalachia State on uh, problem-based learning, um, which is pretty much more hands-on involved stuff and to give them a problem, they have to find a solution to it. So uh, our teachers the last nine weeks have been tasked with uh, they all got to do some kind of learning activity through problem-based learning and uh, get more hands-on and more involved with that. <coughs> uh, it's pretty, it's, it's fun. A lot of them, one of the big ones, um, Miss uh, Miss Williams now is doing a, they're doing research on the old Stanley furniture plant um, and the waste, like, you know, the, the environmental impact of the old plant and, uh, through science, you know, they're learning how to handle waste management and clean that up and potential new businesses coming in. Now, it's just it's a big project, hands-on, to get kids, like, community-focused, also tying in the science aspect of environmental health. Um, uh, as far as testing goes, uh, we're fixing to start integrated testing. It's coming up quick. Uh, we got to do our check-in threes, the final check-in, which that starts April 20th for middle school. And then our EOGs will start, of course, will start May 16th. And uh, on that, we've also got spring sports going on right now. We're running right in between that. We had a home, we had a way track meet for middle school yesterday. Um, we're supposed to have a home baseball and softball game today. Uh, we'll see. Weather, weather's been a nightmare with that, but that's kind of an update for middle school. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. Ms. Hook. So, um, if you'll pardon my voice, I am going to be better to go on that fifth grade uh, Charleston trip tomorrow. Um, Debbie at, from Erlanger has got me on some high-powered stuff, so it's going to be fine. That's what I keep telling myself. Um, we have kindergarten registration coming up April the 29th. I want you to remember, with North Carolina class size law change, if I have 90 students enroll in kindergarten, I'm going to have five kindergarten classrooms. If I have 91 students enroll, I'm going to have six kindergarten classrooms. It comes down to one student. If I get that one student the third week of September, that's when I'm tasked with making that sixth classroom. 
It's all the way up to October the 20th. So it's very important and we're trying to get the word out about the importance for folks that if you have a, a student that's coming to kindergarten next year, we need to know they're coming so that we can plan as best we can for the number of classrooms that we're gonna have to have. But we'll know more after that April 29th registration with how close we are to 91. Um, we also have a meeting coming up April the 21st, next year's fifth grade trip. The dates are already set for the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday before spring break for next year. We're meeting with our fourth grade parents, giving them all the details so that they can go ahead and start getting themselves signed up. Because the earlier they sign up, the more affordable the monthly cost of the trip is. And so we're trying to get that information out to them as early as possible. Um, we will be leaving from the lower gym. We're meeting at 7 a.m. in the morning to load the bus and head on our inaugural fifth grade Charleston trip. There's gonna be 40 people going, so I feel like for a first trip, that's a great number. So we'll be posting pictures and just some, some fun stuff that we're gonna, we're gonna be doing. Um, on the 23rd, we have the father-daughter dance that's uh, sponsored by our Sunshine Committee, and they raise money and do things for staff morale. Um, they've really uh, done a lot for the school this school year, and so they're <coughs> hosting that dance on the 23rd. And uh, this last remote day we had, March 23rd, our teachers sat through their entire day of Unit 2 of Letters, which is the state-required uh, literacy professional development and they're continually working on those bridge to practice activities so we are progressing through that and it's a lot of work but our teachers are progressing through that nicely and keeping themselves up to date. Thank you. Uh, if I might mention sure. I would also like to uh, mention that Ms. Hooper is now Dr. Hooper. Mm -hmm. um, she completed her doctorate degree uh, last, last week. Uh, yeah, yeah, defended on March 22nd. Congratulations. Ms. Williams. Good morning. If I could bring some data to you this morning, um, the first thing that I'm going to share with you are some reports that you have been accustomed to seeing in the past. This is your uh, data for your school nurses. The first sheet that you look at will be uh, information from the elementary school. When you flip to the second page, you will see information from the middle school and high school. And I think it always shines. You can see very clearly how um, busy those two stations are and the good work that our nursing departments are doing right now. Um, I also heard the principals have a copy as well that I'll share with you. What is this second page? The second page is the middle school and high school for that one. Ms. Ellen, would you like a copy of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions about what you're looking at for the nurses section? Yeah, I got one. Okay. Uh, on the middle school, it says uh, the reason is injury 38, then it says other 54. Would that be COVID? No. No. No, um, because Good. there's a COVID section. I believe it is right here. Yeah, at COVID the test. Bottom. At the bottom. Uh -huh. Oh, at the bottom, yeah. okay. But that says COVID tests. Our, our COVID numbers are, are very good. Very right low. Here. Very, yeah. very low, very stable right now. Just good. Good. And if I could draw your attention to one more set of data, I don't want to overly saturate you with, with numbers, but we are seeing an increase in students who are needing multiple layers of mental health support. And what I've done is I've extracted some data that I think is very powerful. So I pulled Ms. Katrina Downs' data from the middle school and high school. She's our social worker. And I want you to take a look at the numbers and the trends from January to February and then into the month of March. So I've highlighted some numbers here that I would really like for you to pay close attention to. Uh, I'm going to send January's numbers to you first and have you look at those. And again, this is only our middle school and high school social work numbers, but I think it's very indicative of what we are seeing across the entire district. Once you get January's, um, I'm going to send you February. What is, what is, what is this? 
right here. Okay, so um, let me get these passed out to principals and then I'll look at that as mom. What is your question? The, the third highlighted number of counseling crisis. Yes, so those are situations where that particular social worker has determined that it is on a crisis level. That perhaps a student is cutting, perhaps they are um, encountering some suicidal ideations, perhaps um, there's some major safety concerns in the home. So that's what that indicates. So now I want to give you March's numbers and I want you to look at the differences and, and the changes in our numbers. in February to 73, and then in March to 76. Look again at the bottom, right here where the third one highlighted, number of counseling sessions requiring a crisis intervention. You went from two, it remained stable at two, and then you jumped to six by the month of March. That means that we've had to call on other agencies, other outside resources to help with those crisis situations. Mm -hmm. So I felt like that it was very important that I showed you those numbers to, to let you know that we are working diligently to make sure that our students are protected from the mental health and behavioral health side of things. As a result of that, we have reached out to Western Carolina University and we've said we need some additional resources in Graham County. Um, they are very willing to partner with us right now. I'm very excited to report that as of yesterday, I received an email where they are going to begin sending us an intern from their um, master's program and their bachelor's program to work in Graham County uh, and to assist us with a lot of these essential needs that we have. So I'm, I'm excited about that. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is that in the month of May, we are partnering with, uh, partnering with Duke University Hospital and they are going to train staff, particularly people who work mainly in this field with social work and mental health, um, and they are going to get a, a significant training on how to assist students with panic attacks. I think that's very, very powerful that we will have some good cutting edge training for social workers, nurses, counselors who are dealing with students in their office experiencing these types of, of challenges. So that will be May 12th. I invite you to attend if you'd like to. And again, that's going to be with Dr. Nathan, Nathan Copeland uh, at 930 on May 12th. And then the course that come is going to be here at this office. Yeah. And then to leave you with some positive information, Ms. Knott, Mr. Moody, and myself were able to meet with the Teacher of the Year, Ms. Eugenia Floyd. I think that was last week on that. And so we were very honored to have her on our campus um, to know that she traveled that distance with us to sit with new and beginning teachers and to provide some positive support was very profound for us to be able to have in our community. Where's she from? Well, she is from right outside the Chapel Hill area. Well, these interns from Western will they be vetted, or will we have to vet them to be in the school system? They we would they vet them and they send it to us. Okay, it all goes to me. And the beautiful thing about that is that right now Western Carolina has a lot of money where they can pay them some stipends uh, to work in their internships, and so we're going to get a, a really nice crop of people hopefully. And I'll go along with what Ms. Williams has said. I know that those are middle and high school members, but Ms. Davis, our school counselor, uh, would say that, and I would agree with her, that we're seeing the same uptick and trend uh, pre-K-5. 
And what I would like to do is since I've presented middle and high school to you today, next month I would like to bring elementary information to you. I, I did not want to overly saturate you with so many numbers, but what I'd like to show is a pattern. And so next month my, my goal is to bring elementary counseling numbers to you. Are we adding a new enrollment across these months? Does anyone know? Of students. Of students enrollments as far as and we have new enrollments. New enrollments coming oh, yeah, in. We have a new enrollment. Okay. Have you have, have you, Mr. Nams, had new enrollments? I think uh, a few, not as many, no, three or four. Okay. A few. I think Ms. Knight has an update she wants uh, to meet. Mr. Murphy, do you have anything from safe schools? Uh, I was in the mind of Kevin for the work that I did that year. We got awarded a uh, uh, safe schools grant for almost $20,000, which we're going to uh, add additional cameras uh, to our campuses. Uh, put what we call halos in our bathrooms. We're having a tremendous amount of problems in our student restrooms, and the schools are doing a great job of trying to regulate it and trying to uh, cover it and, you know, watch it, but we can't be there all day long. And uh, damage, we're vaping, bites, whatever. So we're hoping these halo systems will help alleviate some of that, uh, because for some reason our lawyer won't let me put the cameras in our bathrooms. Well, how does so, that work? Halos are uh, sensors that catch, you know, they catch okay. vape, and it also catches loud noise. So like I said, there's a fight, scuffle, they're destroying anything, and it detects gunshots, things like that. And we're going to try them out in 12 different uh, restrooms on all campuses and just see if that, that helps you. Uh, so, the main thing that we do is wire it and left the cat five wire a couple of inches down, and one of the kids have already found it and jerked it all the way down. So, uh, it's just, it's, 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 you know, getting to that point. So, we're hoping that will cover some of that. Uh, get another dozen handheld radios to pass out on campuses. And uh, get more lockdown barricades. Uh, uh, we need a few more extra here, then I'll have enough to go to the middle school way uh, as well. Uh, so that was flat. Do, do you maybe go on with building your grounds or white? No, I'll, 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 I'll go next. next. Uh, I'm saying, can I ask something? Is there a possibility in the near future that we can have a, a, a total block on cell phones in the building? Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd love nothing better because there's nothing but I have. Well, let me ask you this. How, how hard is that to do or how is this Well, you got other things to consider about the cell phone block. If you block them, you block everybody's. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, in case of emergency or something like that, uh, that's something to look at. But uh, cell phones, are, and, and they've really cracked down on here lately, especially with the, the bullying and stuff that's going on, and we're trying to get to the bottom of a lot of it. Uh, I mean, I've been addressing those things. Out, so, so, but, uh, but like I said, it's. Uh, uh, it's, cell phones you have to create it from are no different basically crack cocaine with a kid. They cannot function without them. They're so glued to them and uh, it's, 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 been, it's, it's hard you know, to, to get them, they sneak around or whatever, but uh, it's just that's all they do. And uh, to the point where they you know, even hard to communicate. I think that's the reason they can't deal with face-to-face -face peer, peer, peer interaction. No, that's, yeah, that's, 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 been, that's been like every 10 when I was in school principal. That's at their lunch table and text each other so we can talk. So, uh, so like I said, it's you know, a big good thing, but like I said, it's, it's, it's harder than that. So, we maybe some know we can come up with something that would help alleviate that problem. So. Okay. Um, I just wanted to bring up a few things. Um, I know that the Board of Education is working with the Schools and Ms. Wiggins mentioned that we had an opportunity to meet with the, the State Teacher of the Year, and that was nice for our staff, our new staff, to be able to meet with her and, and hear that they had some similarities with what she was doing. She was very encouraging to them, and we appreciate her coming. Uh, we have had, it's my understanding that we have had some parents that have applied with uh, the State Superintendent's Parent Stakeholder Advisory Group, so I, I'm not sure if they will be chosen or not as a representative of Western North Carolina, but that we have had some applications. So um, that would be nice to have them to have a voice at the state level if they are chosen. Um, we have a group of stakeholders that will be involved with the Portrait of a Graduate webinars uh, series. That is a group of uh, webinars that the state superintendent is uh, putting together with uh, stakeholders across the state. And uh, Mr. Kendra has been, um, uh, I asked him to be a representative on that. 
and uh, there's parents, there's students, there's teachers, uh, just a whole group of people, and those actually kick off tonight. So um, if you wonder what we're doing from 6.38 to 39, some of us are doing that. Uh, it's gonna be, it'll be great to be a voice in what happens with some graduation outcomes as well. Um, we had a, we have had a series of meetings with um, Bianca Pearson, who is with the uh, FBI office out of Asheville. Uh, she and a couple of the other agents actually were here. Um, our board member, Mr. Allison, joined us for that. Um, and we had several stakeholders over here as well, including a student, to look at uh, a, a presentation that they're going to be doing for the students and for uh, staff and families coming up at the end of April on cyber security and some uh, things that are associated with risky behaviors because of that. So we're, we're encouraged that hopefully they can um, present that in a way the kids will listen. Uh, that's certainly something we try to present all the time, but um, Maybe they hear it straight from the FBI, they'll take it seriously. It is such a dangerous, dangerous thing for our students to, uh, like we talked about, the social media aspect. And it's, you, it's at all kids, it's not kids that, that you feel like would have risky behaviors already, it's all kids that are subject to this. So, as we get the exact details from those. Uh, from those agents at the FBI, we'll be getting that out to the Ram Star, on our social media, to all of our families, so that um, everyone, it would be a wonderful thing if we could pack um, our school when we have that presentation and in the evening, do like we do in the ball game. This is something that every parent needs to hear, not, you know, I think my kid's a good kid, but I need to hear it as well. Everybody needs to hear this presentation. If you're a caregiver, if you know somebody that has kids, everybody needs to hear this. Uh, it might even be something that we, you know, we're sitting in the middle of a, a, the, our location, we're, we're prime for human trafficking. Uh, you think it doesn't happen, they're going to give some cases of things that are happening right around us. And uh, if you think about our, our geographical location between Knoxville, Atlanta, you know, Asheville, I mean, we're just prime location. So uh, I think this will be a, a public presentation that everybody needs to be a part of. Um, so that will be coming up, and I'll be getting you some information. That will be the end of April, so just pay attention to our social media, and as a board, I will inform you when I know more about the exact details of that. Um, we are awaiting uh, hearing about our Golden Leaf. We applied for a $500,000 Golden Leaf grant. We'll know that maybe next week. We'll also know if we were uh, one of the uh, finalists for the needs-based grant that we sent for the elementary school. Uh, and that'd be a $14 million building expansion grant if it were to happen. So we'll know about that next week as well. We have several summer camps we're beginning to uh, get going and uh, we'll be getting information out there. There should be something for all children to do this summer. Um, and as soon as that comes out, certainly I hope everyone will take advantage of those opportunities. And I wanted to leave you with, we're having staff appreciation week, the week of April 25th through the 29th, we would welcome any board members that would like to come and um, flip stakes or serve that week. Um, on Tuesday, the 26th will be the elementary site, and on Thursday, the 28th, will be at the Midland High School site, and so you're welcome to come uh, join us for that if you could during lunch. We'll serve lunch to all the staff, and we're also putting together a swag bag. So um, if anybody wants to add to that, we just got some little little things we're putting in there because we appreciate our staff and we want them to know that. So um, we'll leave that open if anybody wants to contribute to that as well. So um, there's my. When is high school and middle school? Or are they different? Was there together? What when is that? The 28th. Okay. Field trips, principals. I have uh, four field trips that Mr. Ben Davis has submitted. Uh, three of the trips are for the Cy Girls group. The first one is the Science Olympiad State Competition in Raleigh, North Carolina. It will be April the 22nd and 23rd. There will be 10 students on this trip and the chaperones are Christy Greaves and Lori Walker. The second trip is a high school trip uh, it is for the science department. It is caving at the Lost Sea on, in Sweetwater, Tennessee. And that will be in late April. They do not have a, 
exact date set yet, but it will be at the end of April. It'll be 20 students, and the chaperones will be Ben Davis and Adam Brooks. The next trip is for the Psy Girls. It is a visit to the Titanic Museum in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee on May the 4th. That is for 10 students. And the chaperone will be Ben Davis and Christy Griggs. And then the last uh, trip is also for the Psy Girls. It is the Psy Girls Summer College Tour. And it goes to UNC Wilmington and uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And it is June 5th through the 7th, and it is for 10 students, and the chaperones are Ben Davis and Christy Griggs. I have one for the middle school at uh, Jesse Rogers, and it's a reward trip for the middle school student council going to uh, Six Flags on May 25th. There's 10 students going, and uh, Ms. Rogers is a chaperone and bus driver to be a chaperone. All the elementary trips are close, close by. <laughs> and they're going to do six flags. Six flags, okay. All right, let me make sure I've got this right. I don't have the date for the first one. April 22nd and 23rd. Okay, April 22nd and 23rd. Okay, April 22nd and 23rd. You don't have a date for the Lost Sea in Sweetwater. The one in Pigeon Forge, what was the May 4th? May 4th. I don't take shorthand. And the Science Girls Summer College. Oh, all stores June 5th through the 7th. June 5th through the 7th. And you're going to UNC Chapel Hill and Women's Yeah. Okay. All right. Do I, do I know all these individually? Yeah, there'd be there's no questions. All right. Do I have a motion to approve the Science Girls trip to Raleigh on April 22nd and 23rd? The high school Science Girls to Lost Sea in Sweetwater, Tennessee. The Science Girls going to Pigeon Forge May 4th. And the summer college tour for the Science Girls at UNC uh, Chapel Hill and UNC Wilmington on June 5th through the 7th. And the middle school uh, student, council. student council going to Six Flags on May 25th. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. All right, personnel, Ms. Knight. Uh, yes, I'll give you a, a slate of personnel options during closed session. Okay. Budget amendments, Mr. Green.
Next section down is PRC 85, literacy intervention. Uh, the allotment there is $19,533. We plan to uh, use $6,663 for supplies and materials. And we plan to use $12,870, some additional responsibility stipend. Uh, and this uh, number that's for tutoring, remediation. Uh, okay. Next section down is PRC 001, classroom teachers. Uh, as you can see in that revenue line there, where it says $2,586, that's in the debit column. So that is a reduction in our funding. Uh, for whatever reason, the formula from DPI, they took 0.04 positions away in our classroom uh, teacher funding. So that resulted in a reduction of $2,586. Next section down is PRC 39, this is Safer Schools. Uh, Mr. Moody spoke about this earlier. The allotment there is $22,848. We plan to use that for non-capitalized equipment. And on the next page, there will be an adjustment to that. Um, any, any questions about uh, budget management on the first page? Who PRC 001? PRC 001 is classroom teachers. That's the reduction of $2,586. What's the 22? Oh, that's like still, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't look at that. Okay, next page, uh, these are also budget amendments to the State Public School Fund. The first section there, uh, this is PRC 71. This is the teacher's and instructional uh, staff supplemental pay. Uh, the uh, allotment there is $543,139. Uh, that uh, is the uh, supplement that the uh, board approved last month. As you look through this budget amendment, look in the code of uh, the uh, column there that says code number. In that budget code, the second section, you'll see a four digit code there that's 5110. That identifies classroom teachers. So you can see how much you know we've spent for classroom teachers. Second section is 5120, that's CTE, et cetera. As you go down the column, you'll see how those supplements have been uh, uh, spread out amongst our staff. Uh, an example two would be the last one, 5840, those are uh, school nurses. Now I don't have all of them memorized, but if you want to know, I can go, I can go get those <laughs> for you. Uh, next section now is PRC 85. Literacy intervention. We received an additional uh, amount of funding of $2,221. We plan to use that for supplies and materials. Next section down is PRC, PRC 39 is school resource officers. Uh, this was the adjustment that uh, DPI made in an error in their formula, formula and it resulted uh, in a reduction of $2,125. So we have to subtract that from the uh, original map that we budgeted in non-capitalized equipment. The next, uh, the last uh, budget amendment on this page involves two PRCs. It's PRC 130, which is state textbooks, and PRC 131 is textbooks and digital resources. This is not uh, an increase or, or a reduction in funding. It's simply what's called an ABC transfer. We're transferring $45,000 out of traditional textbooks, which we order from the warehouse, which we seldom do. Uh, we're moving this $45,000 into PRC 131. Uh, we plan to use that for other textbooks and computer software, which would be uh, digital resources that we can deliver instruction with. Any questions about the budget amendments on that page? Okay, if you will please, the next page. These budget amendments are for the federal fund. First section there is PRC 110, that's uh, 21st century after school. Uh, the budget there is 400,000. Uh, that, um, that program starts in, on October 1st, the funding does. Uh, this budget amendment probably should have done, been done, done early in the year. But DPI has had a lot of turnover, and they've been really particular about our budget when we submitted that. So we finally got that approved. They did, they did, however, 
give us the funding for that. They just didn't approve the budget. So this is a budget amendment for that. Uh, a lot of those uh, funds are for uh, salary and benefits. Um, you'll see about um, a third way down in that budget amendment, another significant amount is contract services for $60,000. That's what we allocate for Stickle Valley Center for their after school program. You'll see supplies and materials there, they're significant. Uh, contracting transportation. This grant uh, reimburses our transportation department for the trips that they make uh, back and forth to Stickle. Uh, next section down is PRC 49. There's a reduction there in that funding of $6,749. We still don't have an, an answer for that reason. The original allotment that we received was 20, approximately $22,000, and what we actually got was a little over $15,000. So we're still trying to find out this particular uh, pot of funding is um, IDEA preschool, and it funds a, a portion of uh, a preschool teacher assistant. So we'll still get, we'll, we'll try to find, find out the reason for that. Okay. What does that mean if we don't, if we don't have that money? Well, you just have to reallocate some of their salary to another pot of money. Um, we have to do that a lot in the oh, yeah. last quarter of the fiscal year. And some of these uh, program reporting codes and the funds have been used up, you know, there'll be a portion of someone's salary that might be used, might be paid from another <coughs> program reporting code number. So it, it, it's just uh, things that we have to do every year um, at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, the last page, these are our budget amendments for fund eight, where we account for our grants. Uh, PRC 312, this is gear up 2.0. These funds flow through Appalachia State. The uh, uh, the uh, uh, budget for that is $158,000, $48.29. Uh, this typically, um, uh, it's got uh, uh, entries there for the gear coordinator, salary and benefits. We've got tutors, uh, a lot of the expenditures for field trips, supplies, materials, and workshop expense for that program. And then the last section is PRC 664. This is STEM E. These funds flow through RESA. The revenue there is $7,417.28. That's what we received here to date. Uh, and most of these uh, funds are used for uh, workshop subs, workshop expense, etc. Any questions about the budget amendments? You mentioned the uh ABC transfer. Yes. So we transferred money from A to B? That's correct. From It's just one PRC for program reporting code, and it's not an increase or decrease in revenue. Uh, we're transferring funds out of the uh, traditional warehouse textbook allotment and moving it into PRC 131 where we have more flexibility for actually more up-to-date items that we can use for delivery. So, so essentially, the original PRC is for textbooks like books, and we don't probably have any like books in our hands anymore. Uh, we don't need some classes. We do, but for the most part, we don't have any textbooks that we buy. So we were able to, to move that to a different category. So we can buy like online subscriptions for the for the online curriculum resources that they need. Good question. Do I have a motion to approve the budget amendments as presented by Mr. Green? So moved. Do I have a second? So, all in favor? Any opposed? Mr. Moody, facilities update. Uh, uh, Kevin, Kevin Allen, he's a major surgery and he's going to be out of loss or across the curve with him. Uh, the uh, two things basically is one is the, the field beside the new road. Um, we have not been able to touch it because of floodplain issues and them not mapping it out or whatever. And uh, we could we could even smooth out for our mowers to have a clean flat place to mow. We had a, a meet with emergency management director Brian Stevens, who's been great to work with. There's going to be a tremendous asset to our school, I believe, especially when it comes to school safety. Uh, he was to have he made some calls. Uh, somehow we got the uh, the, the uh, thing straightened out. 
And now we have a permit that we can move some of that dirt around on the field. Not only just flatten that, but we can maybe have them take down humps and prepare it not only for our mowers, but for hopefully for future fields. And Ms. Mike can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but we'd, we'd like to at least one or two. We'd like to move the middle school and uh, middle school baseball and softball fields over there, and that way we could have them all on the same campus. Yeah, and not be at P and J or be at the elementary. If we're fortunate enough to uh, get the grant for the elementary, that'll work out just fine because we're going to want to take a part of that baseball field for the building to go, go there. So that's really good good news and uh, that we can start using that land and uh, preparing for the future for it. So just not sitting there right now since it's a swamp. So uh, anyway, hopefully we can get that straightened out. Uh, the middle school wing, everything's going ahead of schedule. Of course, uh, everything was good on paper and then when walls start going up, and you start seeing what things they'd like to change. So I was trying to go in and try to be a liaison between Scott Donaldson and the site manager Randy. And some things we can change, some we can't. Uh, nothing major, you know, but you know, there's always things you can see that we should have done better and uh, or wish we'd change, but uh, it, it is what it is. One of the major ones that we, we did get able to change, and you need to be aware of this, is the walking trail. Originally, it was running right behind the school. We're going to move it up on the hill behind it, away from the school. Uh, may not be able to pay, but we can put crush around it fire and, and pack it down for one small section. And then we're going to have them run a uh, conduit and a uh, cat five line and electricity up there so we can put a light hole and then I can put a camera up there to cover the whole back side. Because that back wall has an offset, and if I put it on a building, I'd have to use two cameras. So little stuff like that to see, and they're, they're great to work with, and they'll have to see what we can. And, and uh, some issues with the offices that they're helping us with. But other than that, it's really, really good. So uh, uh, they're receiving really good guys to work with so far. Everything seems to be happy. So if I'm not mistaken, they're maybe shooting for October, but still, uh, we're having issues with getting furniture, doing some problems. And uh, uh, so I guess we'll look at December's latest to get into it. So that's all I got. Okay. Okay, Ms. Knight, COVID update, resolution, policy review. Okay, so the first state legislation is the time of your board meeting that you look at and see if you want to continue the uh, mask optional or mask mandatory uh, requirement. And I will tell you that we have very little issues with any kind of COVID on our campuses, and I certainly would recommend the mask optional. <coughs> Before we vote, how, how much longer, Ms. Davis, you may be able to answer this, do we have to make this decision? <laughs> and here's the thing, it's, uh, you know, there's uptick in a new variant. So I doubt seriously the General Assembly will move away from this okay. Okay. anytime soon. Do I have a motion to remain mask optional? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. All right, board policies. Okay. Ms. Davis. You have to Excuse me, do you want to wear No, here it is. Okay. Uh, You have a folder in front of you. We got a little behind on policies, um, but of course we have in place a resolution that would carry out any changes from the general assembly immediately. But every policy here um, are required changes um, for your six policies. They're required changes. On the first one, 1720, Title IX, non-discrimination on the basis of sex. This policy basically um, clarifies that Title IX includes pregnancy, childbirth, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And it went on to explain the um, clarification um, of Title IX. Next, um, the requirement that if certain information must be on your website and a student handbook. And that's your 
contact person. And it has to be in the policy on your, and on your website and in your student handbook. And when I update this policy, I want to make sure it's Kevin White. The address was 52 Moose Branch Road, his email and his telephone number 479. So those are the updates um, with, with that policy. <clears throat> the next one is remote participation in school board meetings. Notice it's 10 pages. <clears throat> um, and this, I think the size indicates a struggle that the General Assembly's had with this. You know, we went through about almost two years for, of remote meetings, or you could have done remote meetings. I think some board, and it's not this board, but you know we all get when the General Assembly changes regulations, we all have, we all get. But you made every effort to have public meetings in person. But the changes on this, and what you need to um, review before our next meeting, the definitions. I think that really helps explain um, the policy on when a remote meeting can occur. Um, the board is not required, now this is interesting, the board is not required to authorize remote participation in board meetings. And board members do not have an inherent right to participate in board meetings through electronic means. With that said, no board member may participate remotely more than three times during a calendar year other than with certain emergencies. And that's under, um, if you'll go to C3. Um, and the emergencies are set forth in here. But that would be a public health declared emergency, um, a state declared emergency, or a locally declared emergency. Otherwise, the board meeting has to be in person. But the General Assembly limited to three times during a calendar year, other than for a required remote meeting. Uh, but I think it would be good to uh, to look through that. But I, I don't know that um, Remote meetings are not something you, you have routinely done, but I still think it would be good to have it under your belt. Um, and one of the things with a remote meeting anyway is you must provide a place for the public to come uh, to hear. Um, you can't make an assumption that, that everyone will be able to hear. So you open your school, this room, whatever, for um, required while you're having a remote meeting, at least a public place for the public to go. The next one is curriculum development. And the main change on this is um, A. Uh, the curriculum must be developed to meet state and board requirements using the current statewide instructional standards and, and any other legally required resources. What that means is that by December 15th, 2022, the board must provide a literacy curriculum and literacy instruction methods that adhere to the literacy instruction standards developed by the State Board of Education. Uh, with implementation of that by December 15th, 2022. Okay. Then, um, policy 4300 student behavior policy. Uh, the reason the General Assembly amended this one is to comport with a case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And we had that several times. You looked at um, Mahanoy Area District School in Pennsylvania. Um, and schools and control off-campus speech that has a negative impact in the school. It's a fine line, um, but this is a case about a cheerleader um, off-campus in her home 
talking to some other students, but they were also off campus in their own. And uh, saying some denigrating um, things about um, the school, the staff, um, the clubs or organizations. But it didn't cause any, and, and while the denigration was um, some rough language, it didn't cause any disruption on campus. So um, that's the parameters of. And there was no threat in, there was no threat in language, well, it just, I think, was there? No threat in language toward. Uh, was the language, well, no threat in language. Threatening language. Just right. foul language of that very school organization. It was student organizations too, but um, not teachers, not staff, and um, not a disruption. There's other students didn't come to school to school and disrupt anything. Anyway, it, it was it's been it's a landmark case for sure on the First Amendment, and um, the applicability of the student code. Though it still remains before, during, and after school hours, if you're in any school building or on any school premises, while on any bus or other vehicle as part of any school activity, and while waiting at school bus stops, so there's still a reach. Um, it's just um, this off campus, in your home type speech um, is the purpose of this challenge. Okay. Uh, distribution and display of non-school material. Policy 5210. This is a requirement um, and lots of clarification. This is, a, our purpose um, for the buildings is school material. But there are some situations in which there is a display of non-school material, and this is a policy that regulates it. And the update to it is that it does not apply to the distribution and display of materials by individuals or groups that are on school property in accordance with the community use policy. And that's in the second paragraph on page one. Um, we have a community use of facilities, and it is regulated, um, but they can display materials that may not be permissible during the school day, but they also have to remove them. Um, so it, clar it clarifies um, what's permissible in the when you have a community use of a school in place. It clarifies political signs. Again, you know they can be in the right of way of the school, and you now have permission to remove them 40 days after the election. If DOT hadn't done so, DOT can do it earlier, but uh, school officials can remove it now um, if it's 40 days after the election. Um, now, here's the important thing. If you look in your policy, um, you're having to adopt what restrictions you're going to have on non-school material um, in the school. And there's options one, two, three, and four. Okay. Right now, your your option three. And if you look at that, option four is totally just for the high school. It's not permissible. Option four is only permissible in the high school, not in the elementary, and middle. So if you went with option four, you're still going to have to deal with option um, options for the elementary school and the middle school. What, what you have opted for all the time when there's been a requirement to uh, address your options is option three. So when you review this policy, if you'll look at option three, um, it pretty well uh, sets forth, I think. And I would like to tell you, I would give this principle for you to review because it's in your school. And if he has to be put to the board when they adopt the policy next month, I'd like to share it. Please, I'll give it to you as well. Okay. Then, uh, employee dress and appearance. Uh, there were some changes made um, at, at the end of last year, so they were uh, rather substantially revised. But 
the board still believes that the appearance and the conduct of its faculty are of supreme importance in establishing a positive image for education in the community and for, and for presenting a good example for students. Therefore, the board affirms its expectation that all personnel will be professionally, neatly, and appropriately attired. The policy, though, addresses um, that uh, while you have requirements about professionally, neatly, and appropriately tire, uh, uh, tired, that uh, your requirements are uh, gender neutral and you uh, may authorize principals or department supervisors to develop specific dress or appearance requirements. And this is brand new. You may authorize exemption from the guidelines for employees performing specialized duties that require a different form of dress. And then this is new as well. You must provide um, a process for offering reasonable accommodation for dress for anyone who is um, disabled. So again, more of a clarification of what is um, positive intervention appropriately attired. And then it sets forth the factors to be considered, or seven factors to be considered in appropriate dress. Um, but you still can enforce clean, neat, and professional. And that concludes the policies with the first new changes. And then fun for us to review them for the next week. Uh, Thank you. Ms. Nunn, on um, policy 30, curriculum development 3100, it says something about a shall establish a curriculum committee. Do we, we have that? We do have that one. Yep. Uh, okay. Mr. Campbell is uh, the two main curriculum areas of the literacy and math. Chris, you would head up the literacy, and Kevin White for the math. He bears some of the personal numbers. But is there like a committee? Yeah, so they meet with, I know that for instance, we've been looking at uh, literacy uh, adoption at the elementary school, so she's been a part of that. Okay. It's principal of teachers, but they have it for review for all the teachers. It'll be for review for parents. It uh, comes up, so we do try to follow those. I have a motion to go into closed session. Pursuant to the provisions of North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11, parentheses 8, parentheses 3, and 143-318.11, parentheses C, I move the Graham County Board of Education go into closed session. To receive advice from Ms. Ellen Davis, attorney for Graham County Board of Education, which advice comes within the purview of the attorney-client privilege. The advice will be general legal advice about legal issues or legal matters. Pursuant to the provision of North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11c, I move that Graham County Board of Education go into the closed session for considering the personnel matters as defined and allowed by North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11, parentheses A, parentheses 6, and North Carolina General Statute 115C-321. I have a second. Second. All in favor? All right, we're back in open session. Action items, personnel, Ms. Knight. Yes, I recommend that you employ Dale Farr and Kanisha Garrison as 20, 21st Century Learning Center tutors. Do I have a motion to employ Dale Farr and Kanisha Garrison as 21st Century tutors? Approved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. I recommend that you employ Tonja Stiles in the position of 21st Century Learning Center Assistant Coordinator at the elementary school. Do I have a motion to employ Tonja Stiles as 21st Century Assistant Coordinator at the elementary school? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Um, I recommend that you employ Jonathan Allison as the middle school boys basketball head coach. And Mr. Chairman, I ask to be refused. Okay, Mr. Allison has 
recused himself because he is going to be the middle school boys basketball coach. You mean to vote on that? Technically, yes. Yeah. Do I, uh, do I have a motion to uh, accept Mr. Allison's recusal? Definitely. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve Jonathan Allison as coach at the middle school for basketball? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Any opposed? Are we in order, Miss Davis? Okay. Next. Um, I recommend that you accept Jody Brown as a volunteer. Do I have a motion to accept Jody Brown as a volunteer? Approved. Do I have a, a, a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Sorry about that. And I recommend that you employ Carly Cody and Gracie York Toomey as substitutes. Do I have a motion to employ Carly Cody and Gracie York Toomey as substitutes? Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? <clears throat> okay. Is that it? Follow personnel. Okay. Uh, Announcement. Yes, you will have board training at the next board meeting, May the 3rd at 8 a.m., followed by the regular meeting at 10 a.m. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? We are now adjourned.